I'm McKinney Smith. After going through a divorce, my sister passing away, experiencing narcissistic abuse, and some significant health scares, I realized through sharing my story that I wasn't alone in my suffering. Suffering, subjective distress generated by the experience of being out of balance. In a deep dive to holistically heal mind, body, and soul is where I discovered peace, clarity, and connection. It is impossible to be truly wise without some real-life hardship, and we cannot develop post-traumatic wisdom without making it through, and most importantly, through it together. Social connection builds resilience, and resilience helps create post-traumatic wisdom, and that wisdom leads to hope. Hope for you and others witnessing and participating in your healing, and hope for your community. A healthy community is a healing community, and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. Thank you for joining us on the Heal Her podcast, H-E-A-L, Honor, Elevate, and Love Her podcast, formerly known as the Iwaka My Stilettos podcast the top 1.5% most popular show globally where we have conversations with extraordinary women on their journey toward wholeness and harmony. And since you're already here, you may as well subscribe. As a certified mindset coach guiding women towards peace, clarity, and connection within, supporting the direction of the system toward wholeness, my goal here is to help you thrive. Priya Sam is a former national news anchor, morning show host, keynote speaker, and coach. She's also the host of Turning Point with Priya Sam, an innovative podcast and YouTube show. In each episode, Priya interviews a guest about a significant turning point in their life. In her keynotes, Priya speaks about the value of storytelling from influencing business stakeholders to fostering stronger connections between executives and their employees. She focuses on the importance of sharing challenges alongside success when sharing personal stories meant to inspire others. And before starting Turning Point, Priya was the news anchor on CTV's national morning show, Your Morning. And before that, Priya was the news anchor for CTV Morning Live Atlantic broadcast out in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So please welcome to the show, Priya Sam. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and share your healing journey with us and all your gems and your wisdom. I truly, truly appreciate you. Oh, I, I was, it was a pleasure to be asked. I love your podcast. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. Um, and just mentioning even the mentioning, the mention of the word healing. Um, yeah, it, I feel like it brings up a lot of, uh, of feelings and it, it takes you back to places when you weren't, um, healed. And so, yeah. um, yeah, just even you saying that is, uh, makes me feel really good right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, I wanted to, and I mentioned this before we started recording, but I'm going to share with the audience. I wanted to have you on the show for multiple reasons. So I love having conversations with women that were on the same frequency where, you know, we resonate with each other. I felt like, um, you know, you and I are both on the advisory board for Defy Magazine. And I felt like every time, you know, there was a round table or a gathering, your responses totally resonated with me. And then when I started digging deeper into your brand and seeing your love for helping people with their stories um, and to, to own their stories, I was like, yeah, she speaks my language. I need to have her on the show. So thank you for saying yes, first of all. <laughs> I felt the same way about you. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation. Awesome. Love it. Love it. And the second reason um, is because I feel like Ever since I started focusing on the healing journey, I've been trying to find more women of color that are open to speaking about their healing journey. And I find it super easy for non-women of color to want to be open to these conversations. You know, they've been brought up with the conditioning of, you know, going to therapy and seeking help and having these tools. And I find in a lot of communities for people of color, there's stigma around anything to do with mental health or well-being or things like that. So 
I see that your platform is about sharing stories. I see that you're also, you know, on your healing journey. And I thought, this is perfect. This is great. So that was my second reason. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like even when I started my own podcast where I was asking other people to share their own stories, it took me so long to share my own, even though I was asking other people to do that. And I think a lot of that, I mean, I think, um, and I'm, I'm sure you can relate, but I think in a lot of communities of color, we're really raised with this mentality of, you know, work hard, don't complain, don't be the person who draws attention and is, you know, a quote unquote troublemaker. And I, definitely think that was um, the mentality in in my own family. And, you know, it was work hard. If you work hard, nothing else matters. You know, you can, you can overcome everything. And I do think that that mentality helped me find a lot of success. Um, so I'm grateful for it in some ways, but it also prevented me from seeing racism and discrimination and, and when I would experience those things, blaming myself. Like, mm. oh, you're not working hard enough. Oh, you know, if you were if you were perfect, then this person wouldn't be treating you this way. Um, so I think a lot of my healing journey has been in it has involved addressing those feelings and coming to terms with the fact that there are things that are are out of my control. And sharing my story, a lot of the reason for doing it has been to help other women of color um, yeah. who I know have grown up the same way. Yeah, I love that. And see, this is where I was like, our conversation is just going to flow because there's so much that we can resonate and um, bounce off of each other. Like, I believe a lot of people of color, especially our parents and our grandparents, they've come from a place of survival. They've come from, you know, just trying to survive, uh, to keep food on the table or, you know, to stay alive in some cases. So the focus on healing may not have necessarily been there. You know, sometimes we may look back on our journey and realize we've had childhood wounds or childhood traumas. And it's not that it's our parents' fault per se. It's just that that was the circumstances that they were going through in that time. And the result was, you know, the impact on us um, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. So before we get to where you are presently, I would love to start with young Priya. What was Priya like as a little girl? What were you like as a teenager and what were your aspirations? Yeah, well, I would say I was always very motivated to do well in school when I was young. Um, I think that was my parents sort of really instilled that in me, like you have to get good grades. 98 not good enough. You know, what happened to the other 2%? Like that was a <laughs> lot of, um, a lot of my upbringing. I definitely had, went through a little bit of a rebellious phase as a teenager, where, you know, I kind of wanted to be the class clown for a little while. It was like this weird couple of years. Um, And then I went to a a high school away from all of my friends, my parents kind of like, did not were not into this rebellious phase. So they sent me (laughs) sent me away to another (laughs) school. um, And I didn't love that at the time, but it ended up being a really great environment for me. I had lots of really nurturing teachers in high school um, who really encouraged me and really encouraged my creative side. Um, So that's kind of where I developed an interest in, in journalism and in writing. And I, that's what I ended up doing in my undergrad was um, a a degree in, well, media studies, really, and then a diploma in broadcast journalism. But yeah, I, I, looking back, I'm very grateful for that decision to go to a different school, because I I wasn't, I don't think I was on a great path. I (laughs) like to think I would have found my way back, but not sure it would have happened that quickly. I get it. I get it. I've got a rebellious child myself, so I know how that works. (laughs) You you spoke to, you know, even when you were young and you got, you know, the 98% and your parents asking what happened to the other 2%. I've spoken with so many women that have similar stories. I guess what I want to unpack from that is like the connection between how that forces us to strive for that unhealthy perfection or for how that unintentionally makes us feel like we're not good enough or we're not worthy. Like like I mentioned before, our parents didn't know different, right? So it's not anything that's their fault. It was just circumstances during that time. So now that we have this information, like with your parents pushing you for that excellence and that perfection, how do you think that's impacted you throughout your life? 
Yeah. You know, it's funny. My mom and I actually talked about this recently because I, I had asked her about it. You know, I myself go to therapy. It's something that has come up. And um, my mom is um, an immigrant. She immigrated to Canada in her 20s from India. And um, she when she was telling me where that mentality came from, she said she was always just so worried about us. You know, how are you going to be in this new country? And I want you to thrive and, and to do well. And in her mind, that's what she was doing. Um, so I, I understand where she was coming from, for sure. And I think in a lot of ways, it did instill this this good work ethic in me. Um, but I think it's definitely something I'm still healing from, like a being, mm-hmm. I guess, a recovering perfectionist. Um, and I think just being kinder to myself, you know, I found like when I worked in TV, um, especially, you know, I, you do so many interviews in a day on a morning show. And so I'd have, you know, a three minute interview and then I, would you know, stumble over a question. And then for days after, I would just be thinking about that one moment that literally mm. nobody else noticed. No one was thinking about, you know, but these things would just like haunt me for so long. And like, I would like go watch the video again and watch myself make this mistake and then remind myself not to do it again. You know, just like being so unbelievably hard on myself, which I didn't see it at the time um, that now I look back and I realize like, geez, that was like really unhealthy behavior. And I'm not saying I never do that, that kind of stuff anymore. I think I'm a little bit better about recognizing it and, and being more kinder to myself now. Um, but I, I think what really bothers me about it is when I do it to other people. Hmm. Um, you know, I've noticed um, like even in my marriage, for example, like something I really, um, no, I noticed myself doing to my husband sometimes. And I was just like, why am I doing this? Like I hated when someone else did this to me and like, I don't like doing it to myself. Um, so ther- therapy has been very good <laughs> in working through, um, working through some of that, but I think it's an ongoing journey for me. Yeah. I was just going to say like you even having that self-awareness to say, why am I doing this? And that reflection, I think that it's great that you're able to do that. I think a lot of people, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we often have scenarios with people where instead of the reflection, it's complete projection, right? So you've realized that you do this behavior and you're reflecting on why you do it because you don't like it done to you. And you're like, so you're making that effort to make that change. I was thinking as you said that about a conversation that I had with my partner recently about intention versus the end result, right? Because we could have the best intention um, to do something or to say something, but it doesn't land that way, right? It makes the person feel probably the opposite of of what we um, intended. And it brings me even deeper to the thought of uh, Michelle Obama's latest book. I think it's called The Light We Carry. I'm on like chapter four or something. And I think somewhere in chapter one, she was talking, or chapter two, she was talking about um, our parents, and, you know, a lot of our parents may be immigrant parents that, like you said, with, with your mom coming from India, you just wanted your child to do well. You wanted them, you know, to be a great example or to fit in or do any of those things. So when you walk into a room, you know, your parent may immediately try to fix your clothing or not necessarily criticize, but comment on an appearance or something you've done because they their intention is they want you to do well or be perceived well, but then us as the child or even now adults with the inner child, we're like looking at the facial expression and their action of them trying to fix us. We now internalize that we're not good enough or there's something wrong with us. Right. I think when we start to unpack and then we start to um, reflect deeper on things, we can have a, I'm going to say a broader understanding that sometimes the intention (laughs) isn't or doesn't match the result. Absolutely. I think so much of that, so much of that is resonating with me. I mean, definitely, especially, you know, after I had that conversation with my mom, I realized, you know, yeah, she never had any, any intention of, of making me feel like inadequate or like I was not good enough, but that you're right. I mean, that didn't change the fact that that's what it did to me. Um, And And understanding it now is 
helpful for sure. Um, but it's still this like almost unlearning of, of the way you like talk to yourself, which is so important for, you know, your own, like how you, your own self-worth and self-esteem. Um, it's not just something you can change overnight for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that the women that are listening, especially if they're not going through therapy or have support with their healing journey, something that's important that they should understand is that there's a lot that we've been programmed as kids, right? And a lot of our programming from our, our parents, our caregivers, our environment, our religions, whatever environments we've been in, has conditioned us to be a certain way. And as you heal, you realize that some of those ways were not healthy. Some of those ways were um, even traumatic. Some of those things needed to be unlearned so that we can relearn and reprogram to do better (laughs) for the next generation. You know, now we know better, we can do better. I would love if you could speak to some of the benefits of how therapy has helped you relearn. Yeah, I think just understanding, um, I've been doing relational therapy. So just understanding the childhood relationships with my parents and how those have impacted me has been really helpful. Um, one thing, um, somewhere along the way, one of the therapists said to me, um, I I was explaining the situation where I was being hard on myself. And she said, like, would you ever talk to your best friend that way? I was like, no, never tell my best friend, like, I can't believe you made that like stupid mistake. And like, she was like, so why would you talk to yourself that way? Mm -hmm. And it was just such a light bulb moment (laughs) for me. Like, I think about that all the time now when I'm being hard on myself, like, would I say this to my best friend? Like, no. So why am I talking to myself that way? Um, So I think that has been like, very enlightening. Um, And then um, I think also forgiveness is such a big part Mm -hmm. of it too. You know, you mentioned just the intention part of things and, you know, inevitably, you know, I think I had great parents. They, Mm -hmm. you know, I had a very happy childhood. They were so good to me. Even parents, like the best parents, like there are things that, you know, no one's perfect. And, and there are things that, that we need to address and work through. And so I think that being able to forgive, even sometimes without necessarily having to have a conversation about it and to understand that, okay, this was the intention. This is maybe what happened. And like somewhere in there, I need to find, be able to forgive. And sometimes it does mean having a conversation. Um, But I think forgiveness has been a big part of my journey too. There, there are two main points that you said there that stuck out with me. One is the question that the therapist asked you of, would you talk to your friend that way? I don't know if that's a common therapist question, but I've heard many women who've come on the show that are going through therapy that have been asked that question. So <laughs> I think it's an important question to ask because I feel like as women, especially, we can be very hard on ourselves and that inner critic, the inner self-talk that we do can be very harsh sometimes. You know, we're all our toughest critic. We say things to ourselves or about ourselves that we would never say to anyone else. And even in the work that I do, I've had a a very close friend of mine have to say to me one time, like, give yourself as much grace as you give to everyone else. You know, you're always giving everyone else a pass or a benefit of the doubt or, you know, trying to look deeper into why they do that way without judgment. How about you treat yourself that same way? And then the other thing you said was the forgiveness piece. I think there are a lot of people who are upset with whether it be family members or even themselves for things that happened in the past. And I'm not saying that you need to forget things because obviously those things have taught us lessons, but that forgiveness piece is essential. And I think that the forgiveness is more for yourself releasing that energy. I think sometimes we hold on to anger, malice, or any of those low vibrational feelings, and we're harming ourselves internally. We're ruminating and going over in our head over and over things that happened in the past and realizing or not realizing that we have evolved, we have changed. So those people or those scenarios have also evolved and changed, hopefully, (laughs) 
right? <laughs> so those are the, the, the two main points of what you said that, that stuck out with me. I would love to know what is something that Priya forgives herself for? Hmm. So when I worked in, um, in television, I experienced a lot of racism, discrimination, sexism. And I don't know if in the moment I would have been able to identify, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would have used those words. You know, I know there were situations that didn't feel good and didn't feel right. And certainly some were a little more overt than others. So I could have identified them, but I rarely called them out. And I guess a a couple of times um, when I did, so just as an example, um, so I was a news anchor. We had this story that we were running. It was about a car accident and we were mentioning the race of the person in the story. And I, I can't remember the exact details, but it just was completely irrelevant to the story, this person's race. So I just asked one of the producers like, oh, why are we mentioning this person's race in the story when it's not relevant? And I kind of got like this eye roll and, uh, oh, you're so sensitive about these things, you know? And I just like was a little taken aback, but then there were other people around and nobody said anything. And so I just thought, oh, like maybe I am being sensitive about this. And then like, I just, you know, didn't say anything else. And I kind of, it bothered me, but that I started to to doubt myself. And then those little situations of trying to say something and kind of being met with this defensiveness or, you know, the the eye roll that you're being too sensitive. I just kind of stopped to protect myself too, because it was really like having a negative impact on my own like self-esteem to, to be treated that way. So I just stopped saying anything. And now I look back and I think, oh, I should have been, you know, I should have been more vocal. I should have stood up more. And did I, you know, in not saying something, in not being more vocal, did I leave this door open for the next woman of color who works there to be treated the same way? So that's something I think I've had to forgive myself for. And even when I decided to leave journalism, I mean, my decision to leave was really kind of this buildup of of all of these situations and the impact that that racism and discrimination had on on my mental health. I felt a lot of guilt for leaving. I felt like I should have stayed. I should have fought it out. I should have been that person who could make things better for the next generation. And yeah, I, I think I forgive myself now. And I realize like I'm doing that in a different way. I'm doing that from the outside. So I feel like I'm still doing that work, but that's definitely something I've, I've had to forgive myself for. Wow. That that's big. That is big. I feel like there's two paths that this conversation can go down right now. (laughs) So interesting enough, I interviewed Patricia Dagonat recently about her leaving the station that she was at and the things that she's had to forgive herself for and how it's affected her mental health and the reactions that she was met with when she spoke up. And I think between not just the two of you, but other women that I know that are in media, that are women of color, it's almost like you don't even realize when you're in it, the weight that you're carrying until you leave that industry, right? So I first would love to unpack how that's affected or how that affected your mental health then and the healing journey that you've been on since then. And then I'll go down the other route I wanted to go down. Yeah. So um, I I think it impacted, the way it impacted my mental health in the moment was the way I started to feel about myself. So I would describe myself before, um, I know we talked about, you know, my parents kind of the, the work, hard work ethic. I really felt growing up like I could do anything. I felt like if I work hard, I can do whatever I want. And so when I got this, you know, kind of like dream jobs in TV as a morning show host and news anchor, I was feeling really good at first. And then when all of these incidents started to chip away at me, you know, these like microaggressions, you know, the comments about you're being too sensitive, um, even like, and on the, on the side of sexism, like just seeing how the male anchors were treated, how they were part of the conversation and how I was given direction, you know, instead of being asked 
what I thought I was being told what to do. So all of that really started to make me doubt myself and feel like I wasn't good enough. And like, oh, all these questions, all these people are questioning my judgment. Maybe I should question my own judgment. And I think the eventually um, it got to a point where I was basically accused of of something at on the last show that I worked on, which was, um, which was a national morning show. And I was not given a chance to defend myself, which happens to people of color all the time. You know, white mm-hmm. colleague makes an accusation. They're automatically believed person of color is obviously in the wrong that that's the end of the conversation. You did this. You don't get a chance to defend yourself in my situation. I didn't even really get a chance to know the details of what I was being accused of. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but basically just like shape up or, or you're going to, or, you know, we're going to take action. And in that case, I mean, I was on a short-term contract. I was in a very vulnerable position. So that was my breaking point. I couldn't sleep. I would literally go to work go home, cry all day, barely sleep, wake up in the morning, cry, go to the show, not cry for three hours while I was on TV, go back to my office, repeat. And that went on for a little while until like, I, I, it got to the point where I was like not sleeping enough to be okay. And so that's when I actually finally went to therapy for the very first time. And I started to understand what was happening and to get these words of like discrimination, racism, bullying. And that was the first time I really started to understand what was actually happening to me. So, so yeah, I I, I would say I, I, you know, I, I didn't know it was, I was having a breakdown, I think at the time, but now I look back and like, yes, I had a breakdown and somehow managed to be on TV every day, which I don't know how mm-hmm. my body got me through that, but it did. That, wow. First, I want to say, I'm sorry you even had to go through any of that. Second, you having to go on TV every day and smile and put on an act and a show. And then behind the scenes, you're, you're basically like being tormented because you're dealing with all of this toxicity behind the scenes. And unfortunately it's not an uncommon story. Like I don't want to say just in traditional media, but a lot of work environments. Right. And maybe that's why I say I'm unemployable and I've been self-employed for 13 years. (laughs) But, But all the stories that I hear, you know, women are, gaslighted and you have to deal with the misogyny. And maybe that's why you and I said yes to being part of the advisory board for Defy Magazine and, you know, all of those things. And you don't realize what it's doing to you mentally, emotionally, physically, until you have those breakdown moments, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, and I think as you're saying this too, it makes, it just reminds me that, I kept so much of this to myself when I was going through it. And now I realize so many, like you said, so many other women of color, so many other women experience the same things. But so often, like, I think we feel, I mean, I felt a lot of shame in that situation. Like still I, at that time, I was blaming myself. Like I did something wrong. This is my fault. And so we don't talk about it. And so you don't find that strength and comfort in other people who are experiencing the same things. And yeah, like, I think one thing I do now in my own coaching is really try to encourage, especially like leaders when they're sharing their stories, like, yes, you have to share your successes. That's a part of your story, but you also need to share those challenges that you experienced along the way, because for someone who's watching you, who's going through something challenging, if they only see you jumping from success to success, they don't see themselves in your story. They don't see those challenges that you went through, those valleys that happened between the successes. And that is so important for like, to me, that's where true inspiration comes from. Yeah, I agree. 1000%. Yeah. You know, as you were saying that I was like, okay, this is why we resonate. Um, <laughs> this is the importance of our stories, right? Your story is a blueprint for someone else, you know, to come up, to help inspire them, to empower them. Your story may be about you, but it's not only for you. You know, your 
your story, the importance of the story, if there were more women, if there were more women of color, even just in media, sharing their experiences and their stories, things would not have gone on for this long for as challenging, you know, an environment as it is right now. When we were recording Patricia Jagernaut's uh, episode, like we, we cried there, you know, because there are parts of her story that she was able to share that she can't share in traditional media. There are things that she suffered in silence with, just like yourself, the experience of having health issues and being hospitalized and them not knowing, well, you're actually like having a breakdown from the constant toxicity in the environments that you're in, the constant gaslighting, the constant abuse. And what I said to her was based on the details that she had explained, I said, if you had removed the organization, the title of the major media platform, and you put a person, they would label that relationship as narcissistic abuse. You know, the, the, the everything that she experienced, the gaslighting, the love bombing, the future faking, the, like the whole nine yards. <laughs> yes. So it doesn't even matter if it's a romantic relationship, a business relationship, there are toxic environments, right? And what's important for the women that are listening to take away from this is you may think that you're the only one experiencing this, but you're not. And when you start to share your story, you'll realize that there are others that can resonate. There are others that are just like you. You won't feel like you're crazy anymore. You know, your, your story matters. Yes, absolutely. And I do, um, I do a lot of mentoring now. And that's something I always try to tell, like, I mostly work with high school girls. And I always try, you know, I try to be very honest and realistic with them. And I think I was looking for this. Uh, when I started sharing my story, this was one of the main reasons. And I thought so much about, you know, what do I how do I tell the next generation without scaring them, you know, and telling them like, not to don't, I don't want to tell people don't go into journalism because I think journalism is really important. And I think we do need more people of color as journalists. Um, but the advice I always give now is um, to find your people, you know, w- find those people who who look like you, whose experiences are the same as yours. You know, if you're a member of the LGBTQ community, find other journalists who are part of that community too, because you will likely have similar experiences and you will need each other and you will find so much strength in each other. And just in somebody who can look, who you can look at and like have that look like, okay, yeah, you heard that too. Yeah. That hit you the wrong way too. Like that, there's just so much value in, in just even having that. Absolutely. I agree 1000%. What's interesting is th- there's another book, uh, what happened to you with Oprah and Dr. I think it's Bruce Perry. Oh, I haven't read that one. Yeah, it's um, Oprah and Dr. Uh, Bruce Perry. It's called What Happened to You? And it's studying like um, trauma and and healing. And they talk about the importance of community and how that can be more beneficial than one-on-one therapy. And they talked about how in indigenous communities, and I believe it was like some African tribes, where that's how they heal. Because the social proofing, the connection is what helps with the healing process. And I say this all the time, transparently on the show, like this show is like a form of therapy for me. (laughs) You know, I get to have these conversations with women like yourself and the beauty in not only sharing our successes, the beauty in sharing the adversities that we've had to go through, the beauty in sharing how our pain births our purpose, the beauty in showing that we are more alike than we are different through our stories is definitely therapy for me. (laughs) And I know that through the feedback through the women that are listening, they appreciate hearing this part of your journey. It's beautiful that, yeah, social media can show you someone's highlight reel. They can show you the moments when someone is at their highest and in their makeup and, you know, in their glory, but it doesn't necessarily in a healthy way show the process. And I think platforms like what we have with our podcast. It's like, I've had women that have said it's, it's like a form of ministry. It's like, we're, you know, we're, we're ministering. We're, we're basically creating a community where people can feel seen, heard and understood. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I didn't even know that was going to happen when I started my podcast, but you're a hundred percent right. That is all of the feedback I get too. Like, oh, this episode, I felt so seen. I felt so heard. Like I felt like I was alone in this experience until I heard this interview. You're a thousand percent <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. So tell me more about, more about that. Like you and I have, have both talked in the beginning about when we started our podcast, I think we, we talked about it before we started recording. I would love to know how that's even been a part of your healing journey. Cause I know it's definitely been therapeutic for me. Yes. Well, I, so I started mine during um, the pandemic I had, so I'd left television. I'm, I uh, was working in tech and I was just missing that like connection and the storytelling part of, of, of my journalism life, like no desire to actually go back clearly (laughs) after everything I've been through, but, um, but I was missing the, (laughs) you know, that part of it. So I started my podcast. Um, when I thought about a topic, I got really, I looked back at, you know, all the stories I'd done in TV that really resonated with me and they were all revolved around like big life changing moments and stories that people would share about whether it was like overcoming a, obstacle or tragedy, or just like making a big decision to change something and take a leap of faith. Those were the stories that I loved. So that's where I came up with the idea called of turning point. And in my mind, I was thinking, oh, and I just had my own turning point as well. But it took me 24 episodes to share my own story and why I started the podcast. But I, I just really realized through interviewing people like everyone has these life changing moments, these turning points. And um, so that's how it started. And I, I really wasn't thinking about is this a business? Or is this what is this going to lead to? I just, you know, really wanted to do it as a passion project. But what it turned into for me was me realizing how much I loved helping people tell their stories. And so yeah, so it's really evolved into me <laughs> working with like small business owners and, um, and keynote speakers and executives and helping them to share their own stories through keynotes and presentations. Like mostly that's what I do. But then like, you know, people always come out and say, Oh, well, I'm trying to craft my narrative for my website. Like, can you help me with that? But it's so interesting because every, every engagement I do starts with an interview like this (laughs) where I'm learning about the person. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. I, I love it. I, it, similar to you, I, my podcast kind of took on a life of its own. I didn't start it intending for it to be this way. Like, you know, as a, a mindset coach, I was looking for other ways to connect with people, but my book and my first book and sharing my story, I thought, okay, how can I add value to the community without me doing more talking, because I didn't want to hear my own voice. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll interview other women and have them share their stories. And a couple episodes in, the intention of the show kind of shifted, where it was more focused on not just their stories, but their stories of resilience. And then it transformed as I had transformed to their healing journeys. So hence the name change and, and pivot of the show. But it's interesting how podcasting can actually be a huge part of someone's healing journey, not just for the listener, but also for the host. Yes. Because once I shared my own story, then I was able to be more authentic in my interviews too. Because even before that, sometimes someone would say something and I would think, Oh, that like, you know, that reminds me of this experience I had in TV, but then my brain would automatically say, Oh no, but you like, you can't just share that out of nowhere when you haven't like shared your story. And then I would just like, not, say anything, but Mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, it allowed me to live and to be more authentic and open as a host too, and share more of myself. Um, So yeah, it really was a big part of my healing journey. I don't know if I have really thought about that until right now, but (laughs) yes. (laughs) Okay. Even a little deeper, has your podcasting experience helped with your healing journey outside of the show as you're interviewing and you're doing the show now you're being more open about your story but outside of that have you found any I guess healing tools from doing the podcast that have helped you in your everyday life whether it be in your relationship or with your family you know I found a lot of I think for a long time that dark period of time um, towards the end of my time in television was meaningless to me. 
-hmm. Like I just wanted to erase it and throw it away. And, you know, I I wanted to skip over that when I thought about my life. And once I started sharing my story and getting, you know, people reach out to me and say, Hey, like this was so helpful to hear this from you. I'm experiencing this right now. Or like, I, you know, I felt so seen and heard or, I'm a new young journalist and I, I didn't know that this was like how other women of color would experience the industry. This was so insightful. All of those things started to bring value to that period of time um, that I otherwise like just wanted to forget about. And so I think that has been a big part of, of healing for me. And then also more recently, when um, there was this whole um, sort of scandal around Lisa Laflamme being fired at CTV, um, and I, you know, I didn't work in TV at the time. So I was really able to be open and speak my mind and like, you know, be a little more assertive about, hey, this stuff happens all the time. And I also had so many journalists messaging me, people who still work in the industry who couldn't be vocal saying, hey, like, you're saying what all of us are thinking. And I just found, yeah, like that really was healing for me. And I think I learned in that process how much of my confidence had come back. Yeah. Um, and I was starting to feel like myself again, like that person who could do anything. So yeah. it really has, yeah, it, it so much healing has come out of it, really. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And the I guess why I even wanted to ask that question is, Again, you know, sometimes we feel like we're the only one experiencing a thing until we share our story. And I've spoken many times that the podcast has helped me gain my confidence through competence, right? Me being able to figure out a thing and then feel confident in it. But as it evolved, me being able to have these deep conversations with women that I admire and women that inspire me a woman that I may have never otherwise had an opportunity to have these conversations with, which then in turn opened up my ability to have conversations outside of the podcast, right? It, it's It's been a part of my healing. So when I asked you that, I, I wanted women that are listening to hear how, you know, you can take on something that is uncomfortable or unfamiliar and the beauty and growth that can come from that as part of your healing. Yes, definitely. And you're right. I mean, uh, same thing with pot, even though I mean, I've worked in TV before. So you know, interviewing and everything was somewhat familiar. uh, But I was used to like five minute interviews, and you really don't get to go that deep in (laughs) a lot of TV interviews. But as you know, like in a podcast interview, you're get you're getting deep and you have to respond as a host as you are. That's how you bring it out those like deeper stories and feelings and experiences. And there's such an art to it. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're so <laughs> right. I mean, I like that confidence from competence. That's, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, I so I went to Toastmasters when I first published my first book, and I got into um, public speaking, I did Toastmasters. And I was someone who was terrified of public speaking. Before I started, you know, speaking on stages and in front of so many people, I was like, oh, like I would rather die. And (laughs) going to Toastmasters, one of the bigger challenges for me was when they wanted you to go up and speak impromptu for two minutes about something. You know, the anxiety in me would overthink and I couldn't, for the life of me, even think of something to say. And then that would further dig into my confidence and make me feel stupid or, you know, any of those things. But I found with the podcast, just being able to have these organic conversations, these unscripted conversations, like I never send my guests questions in advance. We never plan in advance, you know, what we're going to talk about. It's just a conversation. So I think that even being able to practice having meaningful conversations through podcasting has helped me heal some of the negative self-talk and self-image that I had of myself. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. A hundred percent agree. And you, uh, also, do you find like when you're in social situations, you're just asking good questions naturally too? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like sometimes I'm just out and someone's like, oh, that's a good question. I'm yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it is. But like, I think, yeah, it's like flexing that muscle. Um, that the, then, and the like, genuine curiosity in it too, yes. right? Because we've gotten accustomed to asking questions, but there's so much we can learn just from asking a question. Yes. Yeah. I love it. (laughs) Okay. So 
the other route that I, I wanted to go down before we went down the, the media route is when you talked about, you know, having a, you know, growing up in a loving household and having great parents, our parents are oftentimes our loudest critics or cheerleaders. Where did you receive the most praise to help build your confidence? I would say definitely my dad. He was like always a cheerleader, very much you can do anything, you know. Yeah, he was so supportive. And I don't even know if I can like give an example. I just feel like he always spoke to me in a way that made me feel like, oh, well, I can do anything. Like I I can do that. You know, he was, yeah, he just, and I, maybe also it was modeled behavior too in, in, you know, him feeling that way. But I, I, and even now I still think like that's where a lot of my strength comes from. And he still says that now, yeah. you know, um, when I was changing careers, I mean, I think my family was very surprised when I told them I was trying to leave TV and they, they kind of knew some of what was going on, but like, I didn't like give them the whole story um, until a little later on, because it was, it was just really hard for me to talk about. And, and I, you know, at that point was still very embarrassed and, and feeling some shame around it. But even then, um, even though I think it, they didn't understand it, they were still supportive and made me feel like, you know, oh, you, you will be successful no matter what you do. Yeah. I love it. I love when you said that with your, your dad, some of it could have been learned behavior through watching him. Because I truly believe like some things are taught, some things are caught. You know, I know growing up, you know, you would hear stuff like do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> right? But kids pay attention to what their parents are doing, right? It's it's looking at the modeled behavior and doing what we see. So I love that you pointed out that it could have just been through watching by example. Because sometimes we feel like if we didn't hear it, that it wasn't there, but it was, it may not have been in the way that we probably would have liked, but it's there. Yes. Yeah. That's, it's so true. And yeah, it's funny. Cause when you, some things like the other things we've talked about, I'm like, Oh, I have this example of like this thing someone said, but yeah, I definitely think there is so much to be said for that learned behavior and just modeling what you see. Yeah. It's important. It's very important. I think, you know, as, as people, we're visual people, right? We, we, we think in pictures we've, it's, interesting that we don't realize how much a visual affects us. And since we're on healing, I think it's important for us to pay attention to what we choose to look at online or or elsewhere with the accounts that we follow on social media, with the amount of time that we watch the news, with all of those things, they can affect our mental health. So as visual people, I think it's important um, that we speak to that. For sure. Definitely. Because sometimes, um, especially I think now with social media, there can be a lot of negativity associated with or like comparing yourself to others and, you know, feeling like you're not doing as much as the next person. And so I really think there's so much to be said for just being very intentional about about what you're consuming and even just thinking about, okay, well, this specific post or this account isn't making me feel good anymore. So what, why am I following this? Like, what is it? Is it, what is it adding to my, to my life? Um, because yeah, those small things can really, you know, make a pile and, and they can add up if you're, if you're doing a lot of uh, that, <laughs> when it, that doesn't make you feel good. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And speaking of accounts on social media, uh, before we go to the final segment, I want you to tell people where they can stay connected with you online to learn more from you and about you. Yes. Yeah. So you can find uh, my podcast is Turning Point with Priya Sam. It's on all podcast platforms and you can find me at Priya Sam on actually everywhere. That's where I am. I'm mostly on Instagram these days, um, but also on Twitter for however long it is around for. Love it. Love it. <laughs> so I will definitely have the links to all your details in the detailed section of the episode so they can just click and connect with you directly. Amazing. <laughs> so for the final segment of the show, it's kind of like a rapid fire. Um, everyone knows I don't like rules, so it might not be so rapid if I ask you to unpack, but <laughs> you can answer whether it be one word, one sentence, um, and you let me know when you're ready. All right, let's do it. All right. 
Name one of the most worthwhile investments that you've ever made. And that could be of money, time, energy. You know what? I am going to say a solo trip I did to Europe when I was in my mid-20s. I think I just learned so much about myself on that trip. I It made me realize how much I could do on my own. Mm. Love it. I want women that are listening to... So here's the thing. I think like a lot of fear-based thinking, people will say, I'll never travel alone or never do this or never do that. But there is so much growth in traveling alone. Yes. (laughs) And I feel like the boundaries I had set for myself became so much wider. Like I just realized like, oh, I thought, you know, I couldn't, I'd be uncomfortable being in a foreign country on my own when I realized, oh no, this is so exciting. It's an adventure. Also, I traveled with people before, but on my own, I met all of these new people that I think, you know, I was so much more approachable because I was on my own and it was a completely different experience. And it gave me even more of that sense of, uh, of loving independence and, and um, finding it empowering. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you a thousand percent. And I wanted to like expand on that, but then it wouldn't be like a rapid fire. So I'm going to go with the next question. (laughs) All right. <laughs> what advice would you give to a woman that is trying to rush her healing? Oh, definitely sounds like something I would do, first of all. <laughs> um, you know, I think um, to look for the small wins because I think, you know, we just want everything to be better, especially when we finally acknowledge that something needs to be fixed or addressed. That's like a hard thing. Just that's one of the hardest parts a lot of the time. So I think just take the small wins. You know, if you have a a good therapy session, for example, maybe nothing big comes out of it, but you feel a little bit better after take that as a win. Um, And, and yeah, acknowledge those small wins along the way. Yeah. Great, great advice. Um, I want to add to that. There was a, a documentary that I watched on Netflix the other day and it was, uh, I can't remember his name, but it was an actor that was, doing a documentary on his therapist and he was actually giving some amazing tools. But one of those things is like acknowledging the small wins. Like you just said, you know, sometimes we may be feeling down or depressed or whatever, and we don't acknowledge the fact that we even got out of the bed that day. That's a win. Yes. <laughs> we shall that day. That's a win. <laughs> like something as simple as making your bed. That's a win. So we definitely need to celebrate the small wins. Definitely agree with 100%. you on that. Okay. What's been your biggest surprise that you've had in the last few months? And why do you think that is? So I think that when I left television, I was kind of on this journey of reinventing myself and starting to work in tech. And once I started more entrepreneurial work, I started, I I don't think I realized how much I would love being an entrepreneur. I think it surprised me. And I think, I think the fact that I, I, I'm kind of good at it surprised me, (laughs) I guess too. Um, I always thought, you know, I needed structure that someone else provided. And I think I'm realizing so much more that I can create my own structure. Um, so I, yeah, I think that is, has been a pleasant surprise. I love it. (laughs) I love it. Um, and, and I love to hear that because I feel like a lot of people who are in quote unquote cor- corporate world that I know don't understand how much structure and self-discipline entrepreneurs that are doing well have to to do on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. I think that there's kind of this idea of like, oh, well, you can just do whatever you want and make your own hours. And it's like, no, that's, that's a recipe <laughs> for, I mean, yes. You have flexibility, but that doesn't mean doing whatever you want, whenever you exactly. want. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly what I was getting at without going into my entire life schedule. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely the, the discipline and consistency is required if you're going to stay successful. Absolutely. Okay. What's the worst advice you've ever received? Put your head down and keep going. What's the best advice you've ever received? You don't have to, it doesn't have to be perfect to start but you just have to start. Yeah. Okay. Name a book that has changed or greatly impacted your life. 
so many. I'm going to say <laughs> Grit by Angela Duckworth. Yeah. Okay. I read that one. Okay. Uh, last but not least, what is something you wish women would do more of? Share their stories. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. (laughs) Yeah, we're definitely on the same page. (laughs) Thank you so much, Priya, for not only sharing your journey with us, but your tools and, and all of your wisdom. I appreciate your time, your energy. I already resonated with you before we had this episode. And now I feel like I know you want a deeper level. So you have a new friend. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunities and for your thoughtful questions. I feel like, you know, I definitely shared parts of my journey that I don't think I've really spoken about in that way before. So thank you for just creating an environment where, um, where myself and other women can do that. It's, it's just so meaningful. Thank you. I honestly love hearing all of your stories. I love being able to amplify each other's voices you know, I truly believe that as women, we can definitely do more together. You know, there's a stigma that women can't work together, or that we're catty, but I'm a true believer in co-creation and collaboration. So thank you for co-creating this experience with me. <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. And yeah, looking forward to definitely new friendship and um, who knows what we'll do together in the future. Right. <laughs> And to all of you healers out there, until next time, subscribe on all platforms. Don't forget to rate the show on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And I want to hear what resonated with you. I want to hear what part of Priya's story touched you or was similar to yours. Feel free to you know tell us in the review on Apple Podcasts, or you can screenshot this week's episode and you can tag us on Instagram. You can tag Priya at Priya Sam. You can tag myself at The Real Makini Smith. And I want to thank each and every one of you that continues to listen each week and help the show rank globally in the top 1.5% out of almost 3 million podcasts. I don't know sometimes how this little introvert behind a screen (laughs) speaks to so many people, but thank you. (laughs) I definitely love and appreciate all of you. A healthy community is a healing community and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. So let's continue to heal 